Good morning from Fresh Start. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. We are here in our Amos study. Uh, this morning we're going to be in chapter number 7. And uh, if the Lord be willing, we're going to get into chapter 8 also. And uh, we appreciate each and every one that listen and that tune in. We uh, thank you for all your cards and letters and uh, the uh, wonderful tithes and offerings. We thank you for that. Uh, it continues to help this ministry and uh, to continue to do the work for the Lord. We don't know when uh, that things may come to a halt, uh, but we're going to keep on keeping on. Amen. We're going to do what God have us to do. And through uh, your listeners and uh, through the those that love to study, uh, that's what continues to keep us on. Amen. We appreciate you. Amos chapter 7, in the book of Amos, as we know in the Hebrew, it means uh, burdensome. And uh, it's a burden that God has for his children. It's a burden that is on the heart of Father, the way that his children are acting, the way that his children do. And uh, that's what we'll be covering this morning. And uh, as we get started, I want to make mention that uh, everything in this chapter 7 is... a uh, is symbolic, and uh, so that's the way it needs to be read and be understood so that it doesn't confuse anyone. Uh, but if nothing else to be said, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. We ask, Father, that you'd open eyes and open ears to your word this morning. Allow your word to land on fertile ground, and Father, we'll give you the praise and give you the glory for all things. In the precious name of Christ, I pray, amen. Amos chapter 7, and verse number 1, and it reads, Thus hath the Lord God shewed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. This chapter 7, again, like I said, this is uh, a lot of it's mostly symbolic, and so it takes a little bit of deciphering. It's not that complicated to understand. He said that the Lord hath uh, shewed unto me, meaning uh, the Lord shewed unto Amos, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning uh, of the shooting up of the latter growth. And the beginning of uh, the staging of uh, the locusts would be grasshoppers. So he's speaking about the locust army here. And he says, in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And this king's mowings is uh, your taxation, your, uh, where you're being taxed. And so we see here that uh, there is a swarm uh, of locusts uh, that is going to be involved. And these here would be uh, the Kenites this morning that we were talking about. Uh, those, how they uh, continue to gnaw and to eat at uh, the poor and uh, well, the wealthy even, and uh, a whole world, and they continue to uh, take in, and it says they will, uh, even in the latter growth after the king's mowings, after the king's taxations. Verse number two, and it came to pass that when they had been made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, Lo, O God, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee, uh, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. He's saying here that, and it came to pass that when the locusts had made an end of the eating, uh, the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord, forgive, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. In other words, uh, for whom will... Who shall feed the church? Who's going to feed the church? Is what uh, Amos is saying. And he says, uh, uh, for he is small. Jacob is small. And we see that <clears throat> in 5 and 3. God said, for thus saith the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred. And that which went forth by a hundred shall leave a ten to the house of Israel. So we know that there is a small number uh, that, well, believe the Word of God, uh, that study along 
the lines that they ought to and uh, are prepared for the latter day. We know that there are very few. Uh, if you go out and stop people on the road and ask them, uh, do you know when the true Christ comes? And uh, the majority of the individuals uh, would not have any clue what you were talking about. But you could find a few uh, that may understand, those that have studied uh, for years and uh, other ministries and uh, uh, those that are studying today. They have understanding. But he said here that Jacob, or excuse me, that Amos was pleading to God. And he said, by whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. Of course, we know that who he who will arise by it will be Father that will take Jacob. And when we mention Jacob, uh, we're mentioning all of the tribes of Israel, uh, every one of them. And that's what is on the mind of the Lord this morning. Verse 3, the Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. And so God said that he would not do this. And how do we know that God's promise is uh, like he said it would? Well, first and foremost, God doesn't pull back a promise. God doesn't change his heart or his mind like a man would. He doesn't do it to deceive or uh, to better himself. Uh, but he did make that promise. And we have that promise in Revelation chapter 9 and verse number 4. And... Uh, Chapter 9 and verse number 4 in the book of Revelation, and it reads, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. It's so important that people grasp a hold of the truth of God's word today. It's passing by so quickly that many people don't recognize it. They don't see it. They don't even recognize the prophecies that are being fulfilled in this day. But God's election, they are sealed. God's election have a desire to please the Father. Why is it that we are sealed? Not only to save our own skin, but to please the Father. That it pleases God that when you get in His Word and you study His Word line upon line, and you study it and, and uh, know the truths that you are prepared for this battle in the end day, uh, the battle that will come upon every individual in the world. And without that, Ephesians 6, without that... Uh, armor of God, you cannot withstand uh, the battle in that day. And it's so important that people grasp a hold of the truth. And the truth being that uh, there is no rapture theory. There is not a rapture that is going to take place. The Bible teaches us that we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That we will all go through the tribulation that we will all see these things transpire in this latter generation. Matthew chapter 24 speaks about this uh, parable of the fig tree. And we are living in that time. We're living in that day. As we get on through this chapter and the next, you're going to see a lot of things that are really prevalent in this day uh, to where 20 years ago or our 40 years ago, 100 years ago, it would have not have been seen. It would have been something futuristic. But you, you are living it today. So we see here that in verse 3 that the Lord repented, and it shall not be, saith the Lord. Now, that's a promise. That's a promise from God. It will not happen that way. Why is that? Because God will not allow all of the world to fall. He is going to help his election. Ephesians chapter 1 teaches us that we are preordained, that we are preordained for this cause, to be able to go through and be a witness for him. Now, 
I don't believe that many of God's children, the election, are ones that will keep their mouth shut. And I say that because of what is inside of them, what is growing inside of them. That what grows is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that grows with inside of us. And we get stronger and stronger every day. We see God's promises and we see his prophecy being fulfilled daily. And so we see that and we put our trust in Father. Verse 4. Thus had the Lord God shewed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire. And it devoured the great deep and deed eat it up. This great deep is your oceans, the, the deepest part of the ocean. And it did eat it up. Verse 5. Then said I, being Amos, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. And he is small. There is but a little number. But he is strong. He has help. Where does he get his help? He don't get it from the governments. He don't get it from man. His help comes from Father. His help comes from above. And God sees uh, every individual that puts their head into the Word of God, that puts their mind and their soul in God's Word and studies it like they ought to. Saying, well, are you bringing condemnation on those that do not? It is a part of a condemnation on that individual if they decide not to study God's word. It brings a division amongst God's people. If Father knows the mere content of a man, in other words, if he knows the heart of a man or a woman, he knows when you're studying. He knows when you are reading his word and trying to grasp a hold of the truths. And that's where blessings come from. You want to know how to gain blessings from the Lord? How is it that we uh, continue to go on and do God's will? And uh, it's not through our own strength. It's through the strength of God because he sees you and you want to know his word. You want to be prepared for that final day. And he knows this. Verse 6, the Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord. In other words, the election will not be destroyed. They will go through. They will be spectators. During this tribulation time, during this 150 days, during this five-month period, that when the Antichrist comes, the election will not find him tempting. The election will be prepared. They will not need anything that he has to offer. They will not take part in anything that the Antichrist has to offer. Therefore, they will be hated. The world will hate them. The Antichrist will not like them. But you have the greatest standing with the Father. It's the standing with Father that means more than anything. A lot of people would like to judge you and grade you on your ability and your, your knowledge and your wisdom and uh, your character, how far that you have gone in life. And a lot of people like to sit back and add it up and see just how far you have gone. But Father knows exactly how far you've gone. You see, it was Father that walked with you. It was Father that talked with you. And it was Father's Spirit that delivered the truth to you. So all the praise goes unto the Father. He loves you. And he cares for you. You say, well, I don't get a chance to hear that very much. I don't get a chance to hear how much God loves us. Well, friend, God hates and also God loves. 
We want to be on the side that God loves. Amen? We want to be where God can use us and be a willing vessel for him. We want to be one that God chooses to do his will and that he can trust to do his work. You can put trust in a lot of things today. And, well, man will let you down. The government will let you down. Even your job will let you down. But thanks be unto God, he'll never let us down. He will always be there through thick and thin. Verse number seven. Thus he shewed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. He's saying here in verse 7, again, remember this is symbolic, and he's saying that uh, the Lord stood upon a wall. Now, what wall is this? Friends, this is the wall of protection that God places before his election, and he's got a priority set aside. He said, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. What is the plumb line? It's God's word. His word is true. We know that a plumb line, well, maybe not everybody knows. Let me explain it. A plumb line is held by gravity. And it is the truest in a vertical line that we can get. Now, your truest in a horizontal line would be the water. But in a vertical line, we know that the truest can be that of a plumb bob, where the gravitational pull pulls it down and settles it. So if you have a point to start with, it makes the point down below. I said all that to say that God's word is what will shine in that day. That's what will protect you and I in that day. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not pass by them any more. Father has said that I am going to set my word, this love letter, and I hope that many of you are very familiar with God's word. He said, I am going to set my word in the midst of Israel, in the midst of the Christian nations, right in the middle, and it's going to be the judge. And he said, and I will not pass by them anymore. Moffat, in the Moffat Bible, he translates this pass by as a pardon. But those of you with companion Bibles, it's written there that he will not forgive them anymore. You see, there's a time when God will cut off his blessings. And if you have it, then you've got it. And if you don't have it, you will be standing there wanting. That's why it's so important that we study God's word. That's why Matthew 25 teaches us that there were ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish. The wise had oil in their lamps. What is the oil? It's the word of God. That's what keeps our lanterns burning. That's what keeps us that bright light because we have the word of God. This ministry continues to harp on that subject. The subject being study God's word. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself and those around you. It's very much needed. And again, he said, I will not pass by them anymore. This is, again, the reason why we must be sealed for the protection of God's word. Verse number 9. And the high 
places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. He's saying here that the high places of Isaac, he's speaking of Israel here, and he says, shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel, in other words, the church houses, shall be laid waste. Why would God lay waste a church? Because they are not teaching the truth. Because they will not do it Father's way. Because they will not teach God's word like it should be taught. Instead, they deviate from the word of God. In other words, they push it to a side, and they began to read and talk about what they have heard and what they think they know, these traditions of man that make void the word of God. It's something that is very dangerous in this day, and many people have latched on to it. These traditions of man is one of the reasons why Father continues to plead with Israel to study their word, study the word of God. <clears throat> and he said, it shall lay waste the houses of the sanctuaries of Israel, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. The reason why that father will rise against Jeroboam, of course, we know that Jeroboam took the ten northern tribes and uh, began to uh, bring out some things that is not what God asked him to do. Jeroboam, in 1 Kings chapter 13, I'm going to read two verses in chapter 13, verse 33 and 34. And this is the sin that most, most easily set him aside. He thought he was doing good. Read it in verse 33, and it says, After this thing Jeroboam returned not from his evil, his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, whosoever would. He consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. Wow, what a mistake. What a mistake. What a slap in the face. As a king of Israel would take anybody, it said it, took, it made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places. In other words, uneducated, never studied the word of God. Just place them into a, a church and let them uh, preach? Or put them inside a closed door and call it Sunday school and let the congregation go in there with them? Have you seen anything like that? It's a shame. It's a shame that God's children have no more understanding than that. Than to just to let anybody... Come in and be the preacher. Let anybody come in and be the Sunday school teacher. Just to fill a slot. Just because the man of God didn't want to do it. 34. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam. Even to cut it off. And to destroy it from off the face of the earth. It's not something that God was happy with. It's not something that Father overlooked. It wasn't something that was just a, a simple thing and he just overlooked it. It devastated God's children. It devastated the people. Our ancestors were the ones who were involved in this. Therefore, they had no chance. They had no chance of learning the truth. So back in Amos chapter 7, in verse number 9, and he said, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. 
You know what the sword is. The sword is the Word of God. It's what will do the correcting. They didn't want to teach it line upon line. They didn't want to do it the way that God said to do it. They wanted to take a little bit here and just a little bit there and, and then call that the service. And whoa, huh, 12 o'clock's come. Hey, it's time to go. Uh, the Spirit's done come and gone. How many times have you heard that one? It's sad. It's a sad thing that men of God and women of God have no more concern for the people inside their church. Once they gather all of the tithes for that week, they could care less. It's a sad thing that what is on the minds of God's people today. God's election are few and far between. And they are studying his word and preparing themselves. And that's exactly what Father said he wants. And that's whom he said he would help. Revelation chapter 12, we have that where the woman goes into the wilderness. This woman is Israel, and Father helps her. He protects her from the earth. He protects her from all things. Verse number 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. He's saying here that, that of course, Amaziah was the high priest in that day of the northern kingdoms. And he gave report unto King Jeroboam quite often. And uh, it says here that, uh, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. In other words, conspired against the golden calf that he had set aside. And, uh, well, it's the golden calf today is the same as your traditions of man. Do you see how vulnerable people are? And how easily it is to change the heart or the mind of an individual when you start talking about traditions of man. The traditions of man make void of God's word. It takes God's word and it pushes it all to a side. And people would rather hear what Papa had said and what Mama had said and these people. But the problem with it is that they weren't scholars. They were not teachers of the word of God. They did not have the spirit of God with them. Therefore, that's why the traditions of man, this any moment doctrine, this flyaway theory has lasted the length of time that it has. Verse 11. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. This what Amaziah has proclaimed, it's not true. And it's not true if you are a student of God's word. One would say, well, how did Jeroboam pass? We know that he is passed. How did he pass? In 2 Chronicles chapter 13, we have that documentation. In 2 Chronicles chapter 13, in verse number 20, It says, Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abiah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. He wasn't taken by the sword. He wasn't taken captive, and he didn't be killed by a sword. Now, if a prophet was going to say anything, they're going to say the truth. 
They're going to teach you what is the truth. And so we find here that Amaziah has um, falsely accused Amos. And he said there, for but Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall be led away captive out of their land. Now that part did come true. That part did come true. Verse 12, Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. 13, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and is the king's court. <laughs> wow. Even having a throne to sit upon, even saying that he is king of all ten tribes of the north, he still did not have right to say that it was his, for it is called Beth El, house of Elohim, house of God. It was not his house. Therefore, he did not have the right to say that. But he's saying here, prophesy not again anymore at Beth El, for it is the king's chapel. Though he is a Allowing these things to happen inside the chapel, it's not his chapel. It belongs to Father. And is the king's court. In other words, the tax system. This tax system belongs to the king. And he is to be accountable for all that comes in. Just like a church house, as they receive the love offerings, or the tithes from the people. Once that is given, it is not for that one that gives to worry about where it goes because it is now out of their hands and into the church. Now, when the church receives it, it is very important that there is an open record for everyone to see an open record, and an open vote to decide how that these funds will be spent. And it's something that is prayed upon, and it's something that is waited on for prayer to allow God to know that you are handling things like you should. And that is most important. Verse 14. Then answered Amos and said unto Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. This verse here is very important. I could take a while and, and teach on this one subject, but we're not going to this morning. But I will highlight that Amos says here, he said, I was not a prophet. I was not one of the major prophets that God has sent. He said, and neither was I a prophet's son. My father wasn't a prophet. But I was a herdsman. You with companion Bibles, you can look over here in Amos chapter 1 and verse number 1. And it reads, it says, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa. Now, those with the companion Bible, Bullinger has done the work. And it talks about how that Amos was a herdman of a stunted sheep. And that that wool that came from that stunted sheep was very pricely. They sought after that wool because it was unlike the wool of a regular sheep. Well, kind of like the election today. Kind of like what God's elect are today. And he said, and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. The sycamore fruit is wild figs. The wild figs. That is said there in Jeremiah chapter 24. 
that there are good figs and bad figs. Amos was one who drawed in the good figs. Amos is here for you today. The Word of God is speaking to you this morning. The Word of God is proclaiming that He is drawing the election he is wanting his election to come closer to him and to be drawn in and to know his way of motivation, how that he will transpire all of these actions uh, and how it will happen. If one is not aware of what is going to happen, it will be a shocker. But it will not be for God's election, for they are prepared. They know how these things transpire. They know that God will continue to draw in and bring in confusion. Why will God bring confusion? God will allow Satan to do this during his reign here. And that confusion will fall over the whole world if that individual is not prepared. If that person has never studied the Word of God, like they should, then they will be deceived. That is the final deception. That is the final test for mankind. So we see here that Amos, he was not a prophet, kind of like a lot of you this morning. You say, well, I am so insignificant. I'm not... I'm not no prophet, I, I'm not a teacher, I'm not, I'm not anything. I'm just a child of God. Neither was Amos. But Father could use him. Father seen fit to use him. Father has said in his word in 1 Corinthians that there are vessels inside his house some of gold and silver and precious stone. But there are also some of honor and some of dishonor, some of wood. And uh, Father wants his children to know that he can help and he can draw out of an individual what they don't even know is inside. They may not even realize that God can use them. But Father has many that need to come to him. Many that need to be drawn by his spirit and taught the word of God before the time runs out. Before the sand in the hourglass runs to nothing. We're getting closer every day. Every day. And that's what Amos said. He said, I was no prophet. I was only a herdsman. In other words, he uh, looked at the south side of a northbound sheep all day long. That's all he done. And when it come time for harvest of the wild sycamore, that's what he done. He went around and harvested that. But God was able to use him. Verse 15, And the Lord took me... Uh, as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. I guess the hardest thing would be to realize that the people in that day knew that Amos was not a prophet and knew that he was not a teacher, but yet he was bringing forth the word of God. He was telling them how these things would happen. Do you think they listened? Very few listen today. Very few will listen if they don't have the major credentials. If one doesn't have the major credentials, they assume that fathers never sent them or that they can't be used or that what they are saying is insignificant. Get a lot of that. But that's okay. Father is on the winning side. Father is on the one who wants to 
better the people. You see, it's not about popularity. It's not about wealth. It's about love. It's about loving Israel. It's about loving your children. It's about this ministry doing all it can to help your family. It's about this ministry trying its best to bring out truths so that somebody can come closer to God. And that's what God asked him to do. He said, go and prophesy to my people Israel. And that's what he did. Verse 16. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. 17. Therefore thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be a harlot in the city and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword. And the land shall be divided by line. And thou shalt die in a polluted land. And Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. This is the end result if the word of God is not passed upon. If God's word is not broadcasted like it ought to be, See, do you worry about whether or not the seed is going to grow in that home? My mind is concerned, but there's not anything that I can do about it. It's kind of like reaching in the bag and getting the seed and throwing it out and then going over there and looking over it every day to make sure that it comes about. You can't do that. You can't be concerned. What you must do is broadcast and allow it to land where it's going to land and let Father do the increasing. Let Father be the one that lets it prosper in their lives. He said here in verse 17, Therefore thus saith the Lord, thy wife, in other words, the church, shall be a harlot in the city. And that's exactly the way it is today. You go into a local church house, and I'm not putting down churches. I'm just telling you what is out here. I really don't have to tell you. The majority of you have experienced it. The majority of you have seen it firsthand. He said, Thy wife shall be a harlot in the city. And thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword. The sons and the daughters. Your sons. Your daughters. Our sons. Our daughters. Israel will fall by the sword, by the word of God. And the land shall be divided by line. And thou shalt die in a polluted land. In other words, a heathen land. You'll die spiritually. And Israel shall surely <clears throat> go into captivity forth of his land and forth of in Jerusalem. They will go into captivity. The captivity is to be taken <coughs> excuse me, by the Antichrist. That's the captivity. When the Antichrist comes, uh, the majority of our children uh, will not be prepared. Only if you have taught them the truth. Only if you have sat down and showed them in the word of God what will befall Israel in that day. Many concepts that must be explained first. First and foremost, who is Israel? It's God's people. It's you and I today. It's the Christian nations of the world. But he said here that they would fall by the sword because they would not read the word of God. We have a generation today that would rather be entertained 
than to listen to the Word of God. They would rather hear music the whole hour instead of God's words. And God's not happy with that. Chapter number 8, in verse number 1, and it reads, Thus hath the Lord God shewed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. Your summer fruit is always the ripest. It's always the plumpest. Uh, it's when it's full course, and it's grown, and, and there you go. It is what it is. Verse 2, And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. Correction's coming. The Father's made it plain that Israel is ripe for chastisement. If God overthrew the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, he cannot withhold the punishment that very well may come against America, Canada, the British Isles, all these Christian nations. I will not pass by them anymore. In other words, he will not pardon them. He will not forgive them anymore because of the way they live their lives, because of what they have allowed in their homes, what they have allowed their children to be a part with. Correction's coming. Verse number three. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth uh, with silence. Again, remember that these things that we're speaking of is symbolic. And he says here, the songs of the temple shall be as howlings uh, in that day. They're not based upon God's oracles. They're based upon the traditions of man, these songs. Many of them are very dangerous, very dangerous songs. And the majority of the people, instead of listening to the man of God and God's word, they listen closer to the songs that have been sung, and they get their doctrine from the song. They gain their doctrine from the red hymn book. And they believe more of the songs than they do of God's word. Being it vain tradition or traditions of man. And he said, howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies. And there will be. We're not talking about people that have deceased, we're talking spiritually dead. They are spiritually dead because they are not prepared to battle. They are not prepared for the battle that's going to come. The battle will not be of bombs. It will not be of knives or guns or aircrafts, but it will be of the mind. The battle in the end time will be a battle in the mind of the people. What do you believe is what the battle will be. And if you take somebody that has never heard God's word line upon line like they ought to, but they get their doctrines from songs, friend, they're in a bad way. They're in a heap of trouble. And that's what Father said. He said there'll be many dead bodies in every place, in every church house. They shall cast them forth with silence. Verse 4. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. 
We see a lot of that. Let me go on. Verse 5, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the effort small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. I don't have to go too far into today for you to see these things. How many of you have seen price gouging at the grocery store? How many of you have seen the price gouging at the gas pumps? How many of you have seen the price gouging throughout this nation, not only this nation, but worldwide? That's what he said. Hear this, ye that swallow up the land, or swallow up the needy, and, and to make the poor of the land to fail. That's exactly what they're doing. They are raising uh, the standards, so they say. Raising the standards, standards of life, the standards of uh, the cost of living, to where those that were barely making it a few years ago, they're not making it today, friends. They're not making it. And it's all because of the Kenites that want to continue to draw from the poor. And they falsify the balances by deceit. Again, do you see it today? Verse 6. That ye may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuge of the wheat. Buy the poor for silver. In other words, through usury. They can't save enough money to be able to go and afford to get themselves well, a vehicle to go or a home to live in or uh, to send their children to a better school. So what they have to do, they have to borrow. They have to go through usury. And that's exactly what they're doing. He said that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. And that's a cost of nothing. Yea, and sell the refuge of the wheat. This refuge of the wheat is <clears throat> what they do to your bread. <laughs> what they do to your loaves of bread. The majority of the people in America believe that white bread is the way to go. There's nothing left in that white bread. There is no grain left. It's all been bleached. They receive it. They're stealing everything they can get their hands on. And they're taking it. Many people's animals eat better than a lot of people do. And it's a sad situation. Because we live in a nation that has been blessed by God, that had been a blessing sent down to Abraham and to, down to Isaac, and from Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob passed it to his 12 sons. This blessing was to come by Father. But we've allowed the Kenites to overtake this nation and nations like it. And therefore, that's why we have what we have. Falsified balances. Verse 7. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their work. He said here, the Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob. This word excellency in the Strong's in the Hebrew is 1347. And it's the arrogance is what he's saying. So what he's saying here is that the arrogance of Israel that had been taught by the Kenites. You see, the majority of Israel have a tender heart. And they have a concern for the people. But when their bosses or those who run the companies or own them are Kenites, they do it 
and they do not understand why. But Father says, I will. What did he say? Surely I will never forget any of their works. None of their works, be it good or bad. Revelation chapter 14 In verse number 13, Father has said here in the book of the Revelation, he said, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them, be it good or bad. The works that a man does in this life, do follow them. Do not let anybody convince you that works are not important. There are ministries today that will teach you that it's not about works. It's about faith. Friend, your works do follow you. Never let it be said that God doesn't see. God sees and he knows and he's very much aware. Verse 8, shall not the land tremble for this and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? They're doing that today, are they not? You're seeing it more and more every day. And it shall rise up holy uh, as a flood. What kind of flood, Brother Randall? Flood of water? No, a flood of lies. And he said, and it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned uh, as by the flood of Egypt. The rich men of this world will take over. And they'll think they've got it all in their pockets. But we have in God's word, in the Proverbs, it tells us, ponder not why the wicked prosper. And we're not to worry about why the wicked are prospering today. Well, it's mostly because it's the only prosperity that they'll ever have. It's the only time that they'll ever get ahead is in this flesh life. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in a clear day. We had this sun go down in the noon here just not too far back. 2017, we seen what we'll call an eclipse of the sun. And he said, I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And it'll happen again. Verse 10, And I will turn your feasts into mournings and all your songs into lamentations in other words all your joyful songs will be like funeral songs sadness and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head and I will make it as the mourning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day It will be a bitter day. It will be a bitter time for those that do not know better. In Revelations chapter number 11, in verse number 9, it says, And they of the people and the kinders and the tongues and nations shall see uh, their dead bodies three, and a half, three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Uh, Ten. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. Why will they make merry? Because of their dead bodies. Because these two witnesses uh, will prophesy against the Antichrist, the one that the world is in love with, the one that the world thinks that's where all of their wealth comes from. That's the one uh, supposedly that helps them in every need, so they think. 
Rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. They put them through torment because they told them the truth. Friends, never let the truth bring torment in your life. The truth is supposed to separate a person. Allow the truth to ease into your heart and prepare you for the coming of the Lord, for the day of the Lord on the last trump. Eleven, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. That's why I came. Because of that great fear is what he's saying here in verse 10. He said, I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. It will be a hard time for the majority of the world, but not for God's election. Not for those who love to study his word. For those who know that Father has proclaimed his coming and proclaimed how he will come. And those who know that there are many in this world that would love to change your heart to the lie and take away the truth. In Revelations, chapter number 3, verse 11, he said, Behold, I come quickly. In other words, I come at a time when you will not expect me. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. The crown of life, eternal life, can be taken from an individual. Whoa, 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 hold on a minute, Brother Randall. I, I believe I've heard somebody say that uh, once saved, always saved. And, and once I got saved, that's all I needed to do. Now, you're telling me that some man can take my salvation? Let's read it again. Behold, I come quickly. I come in a time when you know not. Hold that fast which thou hast. In other words, hold on to the words of God that you have put into your heart. Hold true to God's promises. Hold true to his word that no man take thy crown. This crown is the crown of life that you will win in that day for being triumphant for those who withstand the Antichrist in that day. There are going to be many around us that are going to not appreciate you and uh, they're going to wonder why you will not partake uh, from one who is giving out everything. It's because you're wiser. You're wise as a serpent. And you're harmless as a dove. You're wiser than the average. And you know how these things are going to transpire. Because you've read Father's word. Father has prepared you. For this to come. Verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. In the days of Amos, it was very prevalent. Very few knew the word of God. Very few understood because of what they have allowed, what Jeroboam allowed anybody who wants to become a preacher. It's kind of like at a football game and asking anybody in the stands that wants to play. Anybody that wants to play, come down and put on a uniform. It doesn't matter if you know how to play or not. It's the same concept. It's sad. Behold, the days come, and they're here on us today, my friend, right here as we speak. 
saith the Lord God, I will send a famine in the land. A famine means that you will do without. And it says, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, so there's going to be plenty for you to eat. There'll be plenty for you to be nourished by. But of hearing uh, the words of the Lord. It's so important that mankind today listens to God's word. Very few people today are teaching the truth. I've said it like this before. There's not a lot of competition out there because people will not side with God. They would rather side with the super preacher and be recognized by the super preacher staff that we go along with what they say. They think that's where their wealth comes from or their love comes from, but they're mistaken. This famine in the days that he's talking about is hearing the word of God, the truth. Verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In a time when it's too late, when is the best time, Brother Randall, to get into God's Word? When would be the best time to do that? Right now. While you still have time. While you still have time to study and place these truths into your heart, into your mind. Be sealed with the Word of God for the protection of the latter day. He said they'd go to and fro to seek the Word of the Lord. Over here in Zechariah, chapter number 8, in verse number 23, you know, I'm going to read verse 20. Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 20, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, 21, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. 22, yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. This is the day of the Antichrist. This is the time when deception will be all over the world. 23, thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nation, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, that portrays to be a Jew, who claims to have the blood of Judah, but they lie. These are the Kenites. Even shall they take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. They don't have a chance. They're not going to get God's word in that fashion. Harden not your hearts. Seek the word of the Lord. Seek him today while he can still be found. That's God's word. Verse 13, in that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. They will want this everlasting water. They will want that water that Christ talked about in John's gospel, chapter 4, about the woman at the well, the everlasting water. They will want that, but yet they will not be able to receive it. 
Verse 14 to come to a close. Then they swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manor of Beersheba liveth. Even they shall fall and never rise up again. This God that he's talking about is a little G-O-D. And it's the golden calf. It's the traditions of man that live by the manor of Beersheba. You see, it was told over here in Amos chapter 7, verse 13, what did uh, Amaziah say? He said, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. We're looking at a time when people will not listen to God's word. They will not listen to the truth. They would rather be entertained and rather listen to traditions of man. But thanks be to God for his election. Those that have a desire to study his word line upon line. We're so glad that there are many today that still love his word and that still stand upon his promises. Although there is a famine in the land, it doesn't mean that his election have to be go through this famine. You see, even Elijah was fed during the days of the famine the Bible says that even the ravens brought him bread and he sat there by the brook, meaning that God is going to feed his election. Those that have a desire, those that have put forth the effort to study his word and to know how these things will transpire. That's Amos chapter 7 and chapter 8. We hope it's been a blessing to you. We hope it's something been said this morning to encourage you or maybe even to send out his word to others, to be that, that herdsman or that gatherer of sycamore fruit, as Amos was. We appreciate you. Thank you again for being part of our Bible study this morning. We thank you. We appreciate your cards and letters and your prayer requests. We care for you and your family. And our desire is, is that Israel knows his word. That many come out of this confusion and do not allow this famine to take part in their life. Thank you again for tuning in. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless.